Good afternoon uh, and welcome to this uh, three-minute thesis competition here at uh, Aarhus University. The three-minute thesis competition was uh, founded at the University of Queensland in Australia in 2008. And uh, today there are uh, three-minute thesis competitions at more than 600 uh, universities worldwide. Um, this year, we've done it slightly uh, uh, different. We had uh, an, uh, an open call where people could apply uh, with uh, expressions of interest. And we had uh, 34 people applying, or 34 PhD students applying. And 20 were selected. And uh, tonight, you'll see 17 of them. We have one fell ill, one had to go traveling, and one had a, a son who fell ill. So that's what happens. But tonight, you'll see um, 17 of them. Uh, a month or so ago, they went through a workshop where they learned a little about how to structure a presentation like this, how to work with their body language and their voice. And, and uh, then a month ago or so, they had uh, uh, the possibility to do a rehearsal uh, in groups of four, where they also got a, few, a little feedback on, on their presentations. And uh, having followed them uh, from the very beginning, I can tell you that you're in for a real treat today. No matter who wins, they have all gotten some really good tools to work with uh, in their future careers, both for when it comes to body language, voice, how to do a presentation in general, that they can use both in, uh, in when teaching, presenting at conferences, or when trying to uh, persuade uh, their colleagues at meetings. And uh, so no matter who is today, they will always uh, all bring someone, uh, something forward. Uh, today's program um, looks like this. After this short introduction, I'll also go through the rules of the, for the presentations and the criteria for our judges. We'll come to them as well in just a second. Then we'll uh, do the first eight presentations <laughs> due to, to the last minute cancellation. And uh, then we have a small uh, break. Then we'll uh, have the uh, final nine. Uh, and then the jury will go deliberate uh, on the winner. And uh, we will... Uh, work on the People's Choice Award. I'll get back to that in, in just a second as well. Then we have the winner of the uh, three-minute uh, thesis competition here, and uh, that will be the end of it in about two, two and a half hours. The, um, you, here you can see all the uh, contestants today in the order of presentation. Um, starting with uh, anne Katrine in just a, a couple of minutes. And uh, we have tried to, to mix them up uh, a little, so you will have very different uh, presentations. We have representatives from all four faculties uh, from the university. Uh, and you'll be going through a wide range of uh, research projects. The uh, rules. So everybody is allowed to have one single static PowerPoint slide, um, no animations or uh, just uh, the one uh, single slide. There will be a short slide presenting people when they get on stage and when they start talking, their, their own uh, homemade slide will uh, be behind them. No additional electronic media, so no uh, uh, music or video or anything. No props uh, are permitted. And then you're, of course, limited to a th uh, the three uh, minutes, hence the name. Um, and you'll have a clock running over there. When there are 10 seconds left, you'll hear a not-so-discreet cough by the uh, loudspeaker over there and uh, a, a not-so-discreet ringing sound when the three minutes are up. Um, where we, yeah, presentations are to be spoken word, so no poems, raps, or song, singing today. Um, presentations are uh, to commence from the stage, which means that they will have the opportunity to get on stage, just uh, have a breath, and uh, when they uh, start speaking, we'll start the time. Um, and then the decision of the jury is final. And uh, I'm, 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 again, having followed them, I'm, gl I'm glad I'm here and not 
there. Uh, I think it's going to be a tough one. If we could have the... Uh, jury members, if you could just uh, stand up and wait so they can see you. It's uh, Sus uh, Vestergaard, who is the team leader from the Rector's of Communication and Press. Then it's Associate Professor Dietlev E. Scott Brodersen. And uh, then a PhD student and uh, uh, president of the AU PhD Association, uh, Victoria, who will be uh, the judges uh, tonight. And uh, yes. <laughs> and we hope that you are better at making decisions than the English Parliament is at the moment. Uh, this is the uh, sheet where they will from which uh, they will uh, judge from the judging criteria. So you can see it's both uh, both a question of comprehension and content and engagement and communication, which is why they had both uh, the parts at the, at the workshop. Um, I think you all have a, a small uh, sheet on your on your chairs as well, where you can make uh, a few notes, uh, even if you don't have the whole uh, presentation uh, or the whole uh, sheet here for each one of them. So, and that will come in handy uh, when we'll be uh, talking about the People's Choice Award. Choice Award. Um, when the judges go deliberate, uh, in that break, I will find three, five people here from the audience, uh, and we will try and work out a group of the three best. Uh, and then we will, after the break, have a, a short uh, show of hands here. I'll have my, my very own uh, John uh, Brecker moment here, trying to, like in the British Parliament, order, uh, and uh, see if I can, uh, we can have our own uh, uh, decision here on who will win the People's Choice Award. Then, uh, Ditlu will come on stage and uh, present the, the winner from, uh, on the jury. Um, the winner of the main prize will win a travel grant for 35,000 uh, Danish kroners, and then uh, he or she enters into the Coimbra uh, three-minute thesis competition selection. Um, Coimbra is a, a network of, interna of uh, international network of uh, universities that Aarhus University is part of, and so they have made a competition within this network. Um, and the three, there will be uh, juries on all universities selecting the best videos. It will be the video from tonight or this afternoon, and um, then the three best will be invited to present at the Coimbra General Assembly in Krakow in June 2019. And with that, I think we're pretty much ready to begin. Uh, so uh, again, welcome. I hope we have a nice couple of hours. And uh, before we begin, let's uh, give a, a big hand to our, our brave contestants. Let me tell you a short story. An elderly man is lying in a hospital bed in pain, and a nurse enters the room with a friendly smile. The nurse asks, how are you today? And the elderly man replies, you don't care. Get out of here, stupid. Not really a polite response, right? But what if I tell you that the nurse isn't actually a human being, but a robot made to care for the elderly? Now perhaps you feel your perspective shifting, but why? My project seeks to explore what it takes for us to see a human, what it takes for us to see something as a someone. We appear to be equipped by evolution with a very strong sensitivity towards any sign of a human-like social being. In fact, these sensitivities are so strong that they can even be characterized as a kind of evolutionary button for sociality. Robots are designed to push these buttons. And when they do, it is exceedingly difficult for us not to feel that this something is actually a someone. Even robot engineers cannot help but feel emotionally pulled in towards their own socially responsive creations. 
And if people are told to inflict pain on a cute little robot toy dinosaur that screams and wriggles in protest, they cringe. They are highly emotionally affected and even distressed by this, even though some part of them knows that these displays of pain aren't real. But the point is that they feel real. My project seeks to integrate different lines of research into a combined theory about what it is that turns some, something into someone. It may allow us to create robots that do not generate the kind of resistance we saw in the elderly man, but do we want to? The creation of robots that push our social buttons raises a range of ethical questions. Because even if they can copy all the appearances of caring behavior, it doesn't change the fact that they don't care. But perhaps even more worryingly, if the displays of behavior are satisfactory and fulfilling, does it even matter to us that they're only an appearance? In any case, knowing how something pushes these buttons of ours gives us the power of choice. So now imagine yourself back in the hospital bed as an elderly person. What do you want? We don't want fake news, but do you want fake care? Thank you, Anna-Katrine. And next up is Camina. Plants are constantly saving each other's lives. Whenever you step out on a field, you're actually stepping on thousands of biological phone lines that are connecting plants to each other. Through these phone lines, these plants exchange water, nutrients, and they text like hell, worse than teenagers. Well, these biological phone lines, they're actually fungi that live in symbiosis with these plants, and they facilitate this kind of communication. But why? Well, plants, they can't move. They cannot run away from danger. So they need to find ways to warn each other, to say, hey, mate, be ready. Something's coming your way, and something's about to rage. When I started this PhD, I wanted to know why, and I wanted to know how. So how do these plants do this? And to do that, I made one plant very sad. I attacked it and it started sending messages across its network and saying to the other ones, I'm being attacked, you should also prepare because it is coming. So I tried to measure what was happening in one plant, what was happening underground, and what's happening on the other plant, and which language are they actually speaking? I could not really find that out yet, but it seems like it is a matter of perception. Much like humans, when we're stressed, other people can understand that we are stressed. So it seems like one plant gets stressed. These biological phone lines, in turn, sensing this plant's stress, also get stressed. And the microbes around them in the soil also get stressed. And all of this is perceived by the connecting on neighboring plant, which says, oh damn, what am I going to do? How am I going to act? This is all super cool, if you're me, but so what? What can we do as a society? How can we benefit from it? Well, if we can understand how plants do this and how plants get this network and this signaling and this talk going, we can harvest it. We can use it. Because if plants are actually saving each other's lives, we may not really need to do it ourselves. And we still need to feed the world by 2050, right? So, these life-saving plants who are preparing for war, they can just save themselves, and we can rest assured that we might not even have to worry about it. And feeding ourselves is a given. Thank you, Kamina. And then it's uh, Jakob. When a blood clot formed in the legs dislodges, it travels up via the veins 
through the heart and into the lungs, where it gets stuck. This obstruction forces the heart to work harder in order to pump blood through the lungs. If the obstruction is too great, the heart fails and the patient dies. This is a uh, dangerous and common disease and causing more than half a million deaths a year in the EU alone. Despite this, treatments have remained largely unchanged for decades and still focus on removing the blood clot. As it turns out, however, the mechanical obstruction of this blood clot is only part of the problem. As agents released from this blood clot constricts pulmonary arteries and hereby worsens the overall obstruction. The question is then, can we reverse this vasoconstriction and prevent the heart from failing? Viagra is a well-known dilator of vessels, most commonly used to increase the blood flow to the male genitals. This effect may also be present in the lungs, and that is why we aim to investigate if treatment with Viagra reduces the obstruction of the lungs and improves the function of the heart in pigs suffering from blood clots in the lungs. And we use the pigs in this experiment as the cardiovascular anatomy and size resemble that of humans. We draw blood and let it coagulate in plastic tubes. This allowed us to create uh, blood clots similar to what we find in patients. Two of those were injected in a large vein on the neck from where the blood flow carried it to the lungs. Then animals were randomized to receive either placebo or Viagra. The obstruction of the lung was evaluated by catheters and the function of the heart by ultrasound. And what did we find? Well, after injecting these two blood clots, the obstruction increased greatly in the lungs. And when looking with the ultrasound, we saw that the heart was struggling. Placebo didn't improve this, but in animals treated with Viagra, we saw a clear reduction in the obstruction of the lungs. And when looking at the ultrasound, we saw that the function of the heart had improved. So to conclude, treatment with Viagra reduces the obstruction of the lungs and improves the function of the heart in pigs suffering from blood clots in the lungs. And in the future, this simple and inexpensive treatment may prevent failure of the heart and improve survival of patients suffering from this common and dangerous disease. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob. And next up is uh, Jeppe. <clears throat> Did you know that we can solve the entire world's energy demand by covering an area of 350,000 uh, square kilometers with solar panels? You might not have a feeling about how large an area this is, but it's actually less than 0.1% of the uh, surface of Earth. And it compares to our neighbor countries, Sweden, Germany, even Norway. Maybe we should take a vote about which country we can spare. <laughs> Joking aside, in my research group, we aim to minimize this area by enhancing the efficient of uh, silicon-based solar cells. To understand how this works, we need to have a basic understanding of energy conversion in a solar cell. So as many of you might know, the light uh, the sun emits in many colors what we in physics denote as wavelengths. And only some of these wavelengths can be absorbed in silicon. In the graph behind me, I've shown the solar spectrum. In green, you see the part that can be absorbed in silicon, and in red, the part that cannot be absorbed. This red part amounts to 20% of the light from the sun. So, there's a lot of uh, energy here that we can harvest. In my research group, we aim to uh, do this by a process called upconversion. Upconversion is the process of combining two photons, light particles, to one of higher energy. And we can do this in the element erbium, since erbium has the ability to absorb two photons at 1500 nanometers and emit one at 980 nanometer. And that's actually coincident with the most efficient region from a silicon-based uh, solar cell. Unfortunately, this process is very inefficient since erbium is a poor absorber. But luckily, we can enhance the process by focusing the light since the process involves the absorption of two photons at once. And then instead of placing a large lens in front of the uh, upconverting sample, 
we structure the surface with metal nanostructures. And if these are shaped correctly for the incoming light, they can interact and create a resonance phenomenon that greatly enhances the light in this upconverting sample and hereby enhances the upconversion in erbium. Recently, in my research group, we have been able to measure a world record baking 850 fold enhancement of the upconversion process. And hopefully, in the future, we will be able to see high efficient solar cells with this technique incorporated. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jette. And next up is Casper. Uh, I've always been fascinated by Formula One pit crews. They can stop a car, lift the car, take off four wheels, put back on four new wheels, pump it with gas, set it down, and let it go in just two seconds. I'm not studying Formula One pit crews, though. I'm a physician studying how we can improve the resuscitation from cardiac arrest in hospitals. Because each year, more than 3,000 people suffer from a cardiac arrest in Danish hospitals. And only one in three will survive. And I will tell you that if we want to resuscitate more patients from cardiac arrest, we need to learn from the Formula One pit crews. And what is it that we can learn from the Formula One pit crews? Well, if you look at the Formula One pit crew, they will always have the same amount of people for each task. They all know each other. They all have the same training, the same experience. And they know when this is being said, this is being done. In contrast, if we take a look on the picture in the bottom here, we see a resuscitation team trying to resuscitate a patient. These teams are not standardized and they do not know each other on the team. So if you look at two resuscitation teams in two hospitals, they'll be very different. In one hospital, there might be twice as many people as in the other. And in yet another hospital, they will be twice as experienced as in the first. But the interesting thing is that it's not only the teams that differ in hospitals. It's also the quality of the resuscitation and the chance of surviving a cardiac arrest. So in my PhD, we are combining data from observational studies, clinical registries, randomized studies, and also simulated resuscitation attempts. By doing that, we hope to find out not only how big should the team be, but also how experienced do they need to be? And how is it that we communicate in the best possible way when we resuscitate the patients? So by the end of my PhD, we will know how we can get the resuscitation teams to work a bit more like a Formula One pit crew and save more patients' lives. Thank you. Thank you, Casper. And then Manuel. Internet search engines, digital assistants, and language translators, they seem magical. And that is because they are composed of subsystems and subsystems, and even more subsystems that address different aspects of human language. And all of this in order to find cheap restaurants near me or to translate into Danish, is this the train to Copenhagen? When these systems fail, it is often due to their flawed understanding of human language. And these failures have real world consequences, like a translation creating an embarrassing situation, or a message saying I love you sent to the wrong person. In my PhD, I research one of the fundamental aspects of computer systems working with human languages. It's called word representations. You see, 
computers cannot understand the meaning of words. They need us to give them ways they can learn representations of words. And these representations have to be meaningful. They should encode information that computers can use. Unfortunately, computing word representations is a time-consuming task. Even on powerful and expensive computers, it can take weeks and sometimes even months. And when the representations are computed, it is often not clear what information they contain and how we can use that information to address the causes of embarrassing situations. My research has shown that a popular kind of word representation called word clusters are highly effective at encoding information about grammatical role. Thus, they make it easier to distinguish between nouns and verbs and adjectives and adverbs. We can now construct systems that can address tasks that require information about grammatical role. However, constructing word clusters still takes time. So we looked at the way they are constructed and found ways to reduce this time. In some cases, computer training stations have been reduced from three weeks to three days. In another project, we turned to word representations in order to make it easier for humans to read text with lots and lots of abbreviations. We used a kind of representation called word vectors to construct a system that reads every single article on Wikipedia. And it does that in order to find out what abbreviations exist, what do they mean, and when are the different meanings used. With this information, our system can disambiguate hundreds of abbreviations directly in place in the sentence where they are used. This way, making text easier for humans to read and avoiding those cases when you have to turn to a colleague and say, excuse me, what does PCB mean in this sentence here? These are just a couple of the ways research into word representations helps systems better understand what we mean when we say words. So next time you find yourself embarrassed by a computer's clumsiness with human languages, just forgive them. They're still learning. Thank you, Manuel. And then we have uh, Mia. Too many pupils leave school without having acquired the basic skills. We know that one of the most significant uh, things about acquiring basic skills is the teacher. And we also know that it is the teacher's way of being a teacher that is significant. My thesis is that some teachers are talented and significant, really good teachers. And that most teachers have the ability and the desire of becoming a really significant good teacher. So, what characterizes this significant good teacher's phenomenon? And, and who should we ask? Teachers and researchers have given interesting answers to this question. But as it appears, no one scientifically asked the ones who had the experience with the significant good teachers. So therefore, I'm asking the pupils, or not quite, of ethical reasons, and because that I'm interested in the long-term effects as well. I'm asking former pupils about their childhood experiences with significant good teachers. So, as you can see on the picture here, I'm dealing with the dusty memories here. The 38 respondents that I interviewed twice, they have diverse backgrounds. They are in the age from 22 to 81. So they come from all different kinds of newer school, school history. I'm just finishing this interviewing part of the research process, but already now several matters already stand out of the 76 interviews that I had. Even though that meaning hasn't been generated systematically yet. And one of these aspects that stands out is the phenomenon of relationship. It appears that a teacher's strong relationship with the class as a whole is just as important for the individual child or pupil than a and even more important, actually it shows, 
than a teacher's strong relationship with the individual pupil itself. The aim of this project is to, 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 to qualify some ethical standards for, uh, for new language and, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mia. So the final presentation before the break will be from Saar. Have you ever heard of cervical cancer? Each year, around 300,000 women worldwide die from this cancer. And think about this. One in seven of these women experience a recurrence of their cancer. And these recurrences are often not detected in time, mainly because there are not many symptoms of this cancer. But what if I told you that a simple blood sample taken before and after cervical cancer treatment can be used to detect these recurrences before they've had the time to develop? Today, it's well known that human papillomavirus, which you would probably know as HPV, is the main cause of almost all cases of cervical cancer. The virus spreads mainly through sexual contact and actually up to 80% of all people will have had an HPV infection at least once in their lives. Normally, this virus is cleared by the person's immune system, but for some reason an infection can develop into cancer. Circulating tumor DNA is described as released cancer DNA circulating in the blood and it carries specific information on the cancer that it stems from. This gives us the opportunity to detect cancers at very early stages. By using a very sensitive method, we have already confirmed that HPV can be measured in the blood of cervical cancer patients. And we hypothesize that an increase in the HPV level of these women indicates an upcoming recurrence. And if we're able to confirm this hypothesis, we would have developed a new method to detect these recurrences much earlier than what's the case today. Cervical cancer affects so many young women with their whole lives ahead of them, and actually up to half of these women are under 35 years. It's therefore extremely important that we have a method to detect recurrences before they occur. By measuring HPV level before and after the treatment for cervical cancer, my hope is that we become able to save the lives of many women who would otherwise have had a recurrence of their cancer. And since HPV is known to also cause other types of cancers, this new method could be a lifesaver for many more people. Thank you. So, I think we should, if we could ask you to find your seats and let's get ready for the, uh, for the final nine. And I think we have everybody in place up here and we're ready. So, uh, if everybody have found their seats again, I'll just, uh, without any further ado, leave the floor to Tier. Some of you being here today might be parent or maybe a grandparent of a young child. If so, you may have experienced what I have when picking up my kids from daycare. Because we naturally want to know what our kids have been up to, so we ask, what have you been doing today? And I think that at least some of you can follow me when I say that a typical answer could be something like, I don't know, I can't remember, or maybe even nothing. One reason for this might of course be that the child just doesn't want to answer. However, research has shown that these kinds of open-ended direct questions are very hard for the child to answer, as they have to use the frontal lobes. And at a young age, the frontal lobes are still not matured. But 
When retrieving memory spontaneously, that is, memories popping up in the child's mind almost out of the blue, they don't have to use the frontal lobes in the same way. So this made me curious about what types of cues that typically trigger these spontaneous memories. And I can tell you that it is important for us to expand the knowledge about this. As for instance, sometimes a child might be the only witness of a crime. And knowing how hard it is for them to retrieve memories when asked directly, we have to think of other ways to get information from them. So, we explored the relevance of cues in two studies. In an experiment, the child was brought to the lab twice. At the first visit, I showed the child one of two amusing events, for instance, some singing teddies, which are hidden in one of two boxes. At the second visit, the child is left alone in the room, together with the parent, of course, uh, while we film where the child looks and what it says. And many children do talk spontaneously about the event remembered, although they can't see the hidden teddies. Also, on average, the children having spontaneous memories looked about five times longer at the box containing the event content compared to the other box. So this tells us that objects actually seem to enhance spontaneous memory retrieval. As for the second study, there's one thing I would like to highlight. Because here, the parents were so kind and they fulfilled the diary of the children's spontaneous memories, along with aspects such as cues. After doing this, I asked the children some questions about the last memories reported. And only about 20% of the children were able to answer one or more questions, which is very inter interesting because these were memories they had recently been talking about at home. So once again, this shows us that it's very hard for the children to retrieve memories when asked directly if the relevant cues are not present. So next time you pick up your child from daycare, you might want to ask about his day in a slightly different way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Theo. And then next is Sa. Do you know what your risk of getting cancer is? Well, one out of three of you sitting here today will be diagnosed with cancer during your lifetime. But what if I told you that there is something that can increase your chances of surviving a cancer disease? And it is not some new cancer drug, no. It is actually early detection. Because the main reason why people die from cancer is because it's diagnosed too late. But if we can find it early, we can increase survival rates and spare people of long and painful treatments. So finding cancer early is basically the closest thing we have to a silver bullet cure against it. We know that screening for colon cancer can find cancer early. And therefore, we started to screen people in Denmark in 2014 using a fecal test. But the problem is that only 60% will participate, and also the test sensitivity is limited. This means that more than half of all cancers in the population are not detected. So we need better screening tools, and that is where my research comes in. My PhD aimed to develop a new test for early detection of colon cancer in a simple blood sample because we know that if we use a blood test instead of a fecal test, we can make more people participate in screening. The blood contains free-floating DNA, and in cancer patients, some of this DNA comes from the cancer tissue. In our test, we use a very sensitive technique to detect this cancer DNA in the blood. We have used our test on hundreds of cancer patients and healthy people and found amazing positive results. Our test detected cancer 85% of the time in patients, and only 1% of healthy individuals was false positive. This is better than the fecal test. So by using this blood test, 
We expect to find more cancers and that fewer people will have a false positive test result. In a world where cancer rates are constantly increasing because we are growing older, finding the cancer early becomes even more important. So my hope is that these results will make more people survive a cancer diagnosis in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sa. And then we have Simon. I would like to convince you that you can not only train your muscles, but you can also train your fat. So you can think of your fat stores as a bathtub, where fats are coming in from the diet through the uh, tap on your right-hand side. And if a lot of fat is coming, in, is coming in, you either need a big bathtub or you need to remove the plug very often. But interestingly, it's not the size of the bathtub itself that matters. What matters is the ability of your body fat stores to keep the body fat within the adipose tissue where it belongs. So on your left hand side, if too much fat comes into the bathtub, it gets stored in other compartments of the body, which is increasing the risk for metabolic disease. One thing that is important with the bathtub is the plug, and that's tightly regulated. So when we rest, the plug is in, but when we exercise, the plug is removed in order to fuel the working muscles with fat during exercise. And a number of proteins are responsible for the function of the body fat stores, including the, f the uh, plug function. So me and my research group, we set out to investigate if the amount of certain proteins changed with exercise training. So we took 19 healthy male subjects in two groups. One group exercised three times a week for 10 weeks, while the other group served as sedentary controls. And we took out the biopsy from the abdominal region of the body fat and investigated the expression of a variety of proteins. And we actually found that one protein essential for the plug function while we are resting increased with exercise training, which means that while we are resting, then less fat is released to the circulation, which is actually what we wanted. We wanted to keep the body fat where it belongs. So you can actually train your fat. And from a general perspective, we think that our findings may contribute to a more, sorry, a less black versus white view on our body fat stores. So that our body fat is not only about judging it by size, it's judging it by the quality. And we found that exercise is at least one way to improve the quality of your body fat. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Simon. And then it's the Stefano. Since the times of Christopher Columbus, the oceans have played a vital role in international law and for humankind as a whole. The oceans contain innumerable resources and, for example, uh, world trade flows through sea lanes connecting the various continents. The fruit we buy every day at the supermarket, the um, gasoline that powers our cars, have probably been transported by ship. Therefore, the question of who is entitled to regulate and to uh, exploit the sea is uh, fundamental to these days. For this reason, I chose to uh, study the historical development of the law of the sea, which is the uh, set of rules governing maritime interactions between different nations. I especially focus on the um, beginning of ocean-going navigation and the role that played in this development. As the first Europeans started to sail across the oceans, they felt the need of establishing a, a legal status for the oceans. I believe that uh, the analysis of how the first Europeans dealt with this issue can bring light to today's uh, situation where 
in the end, there is still this strong tension between sovereignty and freedom with regard to the oceans. In particular, I uh, analyze the genesis of these of two principles uh, dealing with the oceans. The first, the uh, uh, closed sea principle, under which it is uh, possible for states to acquire sovereignty, possession of the sea. And on the other, the uh, freedom of the seas, which includes the freedom of navigation, the freedom of fishing, and the idea that the sea cannot be possessed by, by men. The arguing between the supporters of these two opposite views about the oceans uh, later brought a compromise and a sort of widely accepted uh, law of the sea. I believe that uh, studying today uh, the arguments used to defend one principle and the other can be still uh, extremely relevant. Since, for example, we see that today there is this strong friction between freedom and sovereignty, for example, in the uh, South China Sea or with regard to the Arctic seas to the north of the globe. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. And then we have Gu. Last year, a family friend passed away from complications of diabetes at age 55. His wife afterwards discovered a whole pile of untaken medicine hidden in the corner of his bedroom. Then everyone finally realized why his diabetes had gotten worse so quickly. He had not been taking his medicine. Research shows that 50% of all people with a chronic disease, like diabetes, don't take their medication as prescribed. Medication non-compliance causes 200,000 deaths each year from the EU. There are various re reasons for this, but the one major reason is a fear of side effects. Many diabetes medicines have severe side effects. That's also why scientists are constantly looking for better alternatives. I myself have been working with a group of active natural compounds extracted from the medicinal plant stevia. Some of these compounds are nicely sweet and have been used as food sweeteners. Maybe you know Coca-Cola stevia. But however, we found that at certain concentrations, these compounds also possess anti-diabetic effects. We know that diabetes is characterized by high blood sugar and insulin is a hormone that can reduce blood sugar. But here is a question. For diabetic patients, which one is worse, high blood sugar or low blood sugar? Surprisingly, low blood sugar is the most dangerous and common side effect of current diabetes medications. It may cause heart disease, nerve damage, or even death. When we tested stevia compounds, we used insulin-producing eyelids that we isolated from mouse pancreas. We made them into diabetes models and healthy models. Then we treated them with our compounds. The results? Well, in diabetes models, stevia compounds significantly increased insulin release. Very effective. More importantly, in healthy models, stevia compounds had no detectable effects. This is actually fascinating because it indicates when healthy, when blood sugar is normal, even patients accidentally taking more stevia will not overstimulate insulin secretion, thereby preventing low blood sugar. So stevia compounds have the potential to prevent low blood sugar. It's still early stage of the research, but I believe this study will lead to a safe therapy for diabetic patients. Maybe we can even utilize their effects and sweetness together. Then diabetic patients taking candy can finally be doctor recommended. Wouldn't that be sweet? Thank you. Thank you, Gu. And then we have uh, yet another Simon. Good afternoon. When I was a kid, I remember getting a Game Boy, you know, one of these handheld gaming devices, the size of a small brick, really. And I remember my dad told me that the computing power of my Game Boy was as strong as the first lunar landing space shuttle computer. And, you know, computers have just kept growing in power. Actually, on this dotted black line, we see something like a proxy for the technology of computers and how it's grown over time. 
But I want to draw your attention to uh, the blue line here behind me as well. And you can see that's also growing very fast. It's a slightly younger technology. It's the technology of DNA reading. Now, we know why we need computers. Otherwise, we couldn't play Candy Crush. But why do we need to read DNA? See, DNA is a data set, and it's hidden inside the cells of our body. This data set is kind of like the code inside the computer. It tells the organism something about how to function. And DNA evolved with life, so it tells us something about our ancestry, but it also tells us something about who we are today. And in a hospital, we might want to read DNA, because sometimes DNA gets sick. It can mutate, and these tiny changes in the code, that is what in some patients cause cancer. One of the challenges to working with DNA is it's really, really complex. If just one patient coming into the doctor's office getting diagnosed with cancer, we take out a few cells and we put it into one of these DNA reading machines, we get the cancer DNA out. Let's say we want to print it on paper to show our doctor. We're going to get a stack of paper which is 130 meters tall. That's a lot of information, not very nice for a doctor to read. So I exploit that we have computer technology stronger than ever. I take 130 meters of data, and I put it into my computer. And inside of there, we tell the differences between the sick cell and the healthy cell, because these differences tell us something about why is the patient sick, and maybe even what we can do about it. In particular, I'm curious about a fact about healthy cell DNA. Namely, there is an autocorrect system when breaks happen, there's an autocorrection scanning the code, repairing all the spelling errors. In cancer cells, this system doesn't seem to work well enough. And I think if we can understand the autocorrection better, it'll give us tools for understanding cancer evolution, but also potential tools for how we can choose better treatment and develop better treatment. So I believe in the future of medicine, where we use the superpowers of computer technology, and DNA reading and giving doctors the best possible tools for providing patients with the best possible treatment. Thank you, Simon. And then we have Sophia. I imagine the most of the people in this room agree that this is not a bladder. Well, for people from my field, that is radiation oncology, a bladder is like a balloon. And I will explain to you why it is related to my research, that is to understand why urinary side effects occur after radiotherapy in cervix cancer patients. This disease is one of the most common types of cancer among women, especially in countries without access to screening and vaccination. So ladies, please do screening. And radiotherapy is often the treatment of choice. And modern techniques showed an improved survival of patients as well as a reduction of side effects due to treatment. But even if in a lesser extent, urinary side effects are still present, affecting the quality of life of cancer survivors even many years after treatment. And we don't know why it happens. The causes are not fully understood. And this is not an issue just for cervix, but all the tumors in the pelvic area. So there is a lot of research going on on this topic to put some light on. How to improve our understanding then? First, we need clinical trials, studies to reliably assess how often the side effects occur and how bad they are. And I'm lucky because I'm part of the EMBRACE study, a large trial on cervix cancer treated with radiotherapy that is collecting information from more than 1,400 patients from all around the world, including patient tumor treatment characteristics, as well as follow-up from months up to years after treatment, we really have the chance to understand what's going on. But then there is another issue, because when we, radiation oncologists or medical physicists like me, create a treatment plan, 
We want to kill the tumor with radiation, but we don't want to damage all the healthy organs around because we don't want side effects after treatment. And we consider the bladder as a single entity in which each part has the same function. As a balloon then, to make it explode, it only matters how strong you hit it, not where. But urinary side effects are complex, including different symptoms, and thinking that all of them have the same cause is a bit simplistic. We have to move to a more realistic idea of the bladder, and this is the basis of my research. Using the large amount of embrace data, I'm identifying risk factors responsible for urinary side effects, including substructures in the bladder, as well as other parameters related to patient treatment and guaranteeing patient the most efficient and safe treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. And then next up is uh, Vincent. Can you guess how I fell in love with electric cable bacteria? <coughs> Let me tell you the story from the beginning. Last year, I went snorkeling a little out of town, up north, a place called Lechtenstrand. The water was so clear and there was seagrass with these long green leaves everywhere. The water was so nice and um, I actually saw a big trout hiding in between seagrass leaves. Seagrasses and other aquatic plants not only provide shelter for fish, but also have long roots, burrowing organic carbon deep down into the sediment, where it is captured, helping to fight against climate change. So a couple of days later, I really wanted to dive into that beautiful world again, and I drove to Marcellus Bo Harbor, jumped into the water, and I was shocked. Not a single seagrass leaf around, instead murky water. What happens in between Lurkton Strand and Marcellus Bo Harbor happens gradually on a global scale. Human activities cause huge die-off events of aquatic plants. For instance, human activities like dredging cause murky water, and with murky water, the plants receive less light, are less active, and that is when the roots become vulnerable to sulfide. And you know sulfide smells like rotten eggs and is actually toxic for plants. So, now I would like to convince you that with the help of electric cable bacteria, the sulfide around the roots could be efficiently removed. But how? To imagine this, let's pretend that everyone here in this room is a single cable bacterium cell, and the wooden pillars on the, on the outside are the roots. And your cells sitting close to the root actually can breathe the oxygen which gets released from the roots. All the other cells, however, you cannot reach that oxygen, but you are surrounded by sulfide. And luckily, you like to eat sulfide. So the only way to breathe and eat at the same time is to cooperate. So please, everyone, let's cooperate and bring our hands up and hold your neighbor's hands, <laughs> forming long cable bacteria filaments. And now you're producing electric currents, which may allow to eat up all the toxic sulfide around the roots and keep the plants happy. So next time, you go out for a swim, mind your step, avoid walking through the seagrass meadows because now you know they protect fish and climate and there's a whole electric world underneath. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. And now it's time for our last presentation from Samika. I'm here to tell you that fixing a hole in the heart does not fix everything. Your heart is the size of your fist, consisting of four chambers, two small atrias and two larger ventricles, as you can see on the image here. Now imagine being born with one of the most common heart defects, a hole in the wall dividing the two smaller chambers, an atrial septal defect. If the hole is large, you will experience shortness of breath, getting tired very easily, and failure to grow. And in these instances, it is important to close the hole. 
For years, we assumed that patients were completely healthy after closing the defect. We then learned that they still experience complications, such as abnormal heart rhythm, and they generally die eight years earlier than you and me. We have yet to understand why this occurs so we can help them live just as long as the rest of us and without any problems. We examine adults born with an atrial septal defect who had it closed sometime during their lives. We scan their hearts using ultrasound. That's the same method you use in pregnant bellies. And this tells us how the heart pumps. We measure the blood pressures in the heart and lung circulation. This tells us how, how soft and flexible the blood vessels are. We examine patients when they're resting, but also on a bicycle. You may be okay if you don't do anything at all, but most of us live an active lifestyle, and it is important that our heart can cope with that. My project is ongoing and we're still gathering results, so I can't draw any conclusions yet. But our results may lead to two scenarios. Number one, if we find an abnormal heart function, we can explain the long-term complications and the shorter lifetime. We can start relevant medical treatment earlier on, thereby optimizing the heart's function. And this means that we can postpone the occurrence of, or maybe even fully avoid, some complications. Scenario number two. Should we, on the other hand, learn that these patient examinations are all normal, that our patients don't differ at all from our heart-healthy people, we can close this door and safely state that the dynamics in the heart aren't the cause for the problems we see. We should always continuously strive to optimize quality of life for our patients. Fixing a hole in the heart is great, but there's more fixing to do. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I think we should uh, give them all a hand. Well done, and uh, having seen you before, I can tell you could probably see that some of them were nervous, uh, others didn't seem so, and uh, from having seen them before, you wouldn't know who was nervous before. Uh, they have really worked on that. Um, now it's time for the jury to deliberate, so I will leave them uh, uh, to that. And uh, again, we are ahead of schedule. Uh, very much. Uh, it says um, 20 minutes, so let's uh, meet again a quarter to. And uh, remember, we have the People's Choice Award as well. So I'll give you five minutes to uh, have a chat about your personal top uh, threes, and then I'll just go and find three, four, five of you, and then we'll make a top three, and then we'll have the popular vote here uh, after the break. But uh, please enjoy the break. We have our jury back after a long deliberation. That's a good sign. It shows that you all did well and it has been a, a tough decision. We're just glad that we didn't have like the EU to give you a three months extension or something to, to, to reach a decision. Um, happily it was a bit faster than that. Um, but we will begin by uh, the People's Choice Award. And um, that was obviously a, a tough one as well. I had to ask more than five people to get any sense of a, 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 a picture of, <laughs> of the top three because everybody had uh, three different people that they had <laughs> they had preferred. So again, well done. This shows that you all did a, a really good job. But a decision had to be made. And um, so uh, the top three, we'll invite them here on the stage and then we'll just do a show of hands um, and uh, see who'll be the, the winner. So here on the stage, I'd like to see Gu. Anna Katrine. And finally, Vincent. So, and this time you only have one vote each. So, <laughs> oh yes, everybody here gets to vote. So now, so now it's, you want to make sure that your friends and family vote for you, or do you want to make sure which of those vote for you? So, the best presentation day uh, was at 
Vincent? Yes. Or Anne Katrine? Yes. Or Gu? <laughs> now, I was just about to do a John Burkhoff and say, clear the lobby. Um, but I'm afraid I don't have that kind of, kind of power here. But uh, I, I, I think there's a, a, by a, a small margin, the winner is Gu of the Pews. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. And congratulations to you too as well. Thank you, you very much. Well, please. And we, I think we have some flowers and a small present for you and a small diploma as yeah. well. Cheers. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And then to the final winner of the competition, so I'll leave the floor to Didlo. All right, so we're about to have this decision made. And I would like to say first that from the side of the jury, this is, you guys have made it extremely difficult for us to reach this decision. I mean, you were all very, very good. So we were down into the margins to uh, really understand uh, or figure out who was who's the winner. So, uh, so some of the things we looked at, uh, looked at is how well did you come across, obviously, how well did you use your slide, and how well did you uh, match the time that you had allocated. So the winner we have chosen uh, was very good at storytelling. The person kept the audience captivated throughout the three minutes, had a very simple slide, but used it to create a visual and emotional feeling, let's say, in the, in the audience, and even engage the audience. Uh, so we're very happy to uh, announce that our winner is uh, Vincent Schultz. Um, Thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming out here today to celebrate this next generation of researchers. Uh, it has been a, a, a pleasure to, to have you here today, especially thanks to the jury for d making a decision that I don't think either has wanted to make. Uh, and then, uh, first and foremost, a thank you to all of you for uh, entertaining and enlightening us today. Uh, it has been a pleasure uh, to follow you uh, all the way through this. And uh, please come on stage and uh, for a, a round of applause.
<laughs> Again, thank you so much for doing this and uh, trying this and being bringing the brave contestants. And uh, we uh, wish you all the best luck with your PhD projects and your future careers. And we also have a small something for the jury. So a small thank you for uh, them as well. And when uh, you're done here, we have a, a diploma for you and something to keep it in once, uh, once you have received it. Okay? <laughs> thank you so much. Have a good evening.